I want to invite you, if you're comfortable, close your eyes with me. Promise nothing will happen. (laughs) And picture yourself going back in time and that special night. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from a village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. And they named him, just as the angel said to, Jesus. (laughs) Yes. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep, when suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. And these shepherds were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said, for tonight I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven. And they were praising God and saying and singing, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to whom to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds looked at each other and they said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So these shepherds hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was a baby lying in a manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary, Jesus' mother, well, she kept all those things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds, well, they went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they heard and all they had seen. For it was just as the angel had told them. Well, friends, welcome to Christmas Eve. Thank you for coming out this night and just worshiping with us. And you know, I got to admit that I'm a little bit of a traditionalist when it comes to Christmas and Christmas Eve, right? When I, when I come to a Christmas Eve service, I want to sing the Christmas songs that are so familiar to us. I want to do candle lighting, and I want to hear the Christmas story. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. And so I just encourage you to just be pondering and reflecting on God's great story, on his great gift that was given just as we read to all mankind. You see, the reality is that in the Gospels, the Christmas story, this Christmas story, Jesus' birth, well, it covers so little of the Gospels themselves. 
really it's just a few verses. And when we consider the, the rest of the Gospels, it's just kind of a sliver. But you know what? It, it's, it's it, this manger scene, this baby's birth, it's important, it's significant. But I got to tell you, most of you already know this. It is pointing to something better or better yet. It's leading us to something better and something bigger, is it not? And what this story on this night is pointing us towards and leading us towards, well, there's a symbol of it right behind me, his cross. And Jesus, we're reminded, was born so that he could die and have life again. And this is significant because this was his plan. The story, God's story, God's plan starts with a baby. And this baby, who the angel told both Mary and Joseph, name him Jesus. Well, this Jesus changes everything. At least it has for me. I imagine for most of you, it's been the same story for your life. That Jesus has changed everything. And yet there might be some here that's like, well, not quite yet. I want to invite you to see him anew, to receive him again today and find out what he can do in your life. You see, it's not what God can do for us. He's already done everything for us, but he still desires to do something in and through us if we would allow him to. One of the things I love about the Christmas season is holiday movies. Anyone, anyone want to call it? And there's a ton of them. I mean, there's some classics. But uh, also what I like about the Christmas season is that they know that a lot of families go to the movies. And so every year they roll out the big blockbusters usually right at Christmas time, right? And one of the things that we know about uh, any type of story or the movies is that usually what you have in a movie is you have the setup, right? You have um, uh, then the storyline, which usually consists of a crisis, a journey, a solution, a climax, a conclusion. And all stories have this. And you know what? God's story does too. Now, like I said, when it comes to Christmas Eve, I'm a little bit of a traditionalist. And I love being reminded and reading the Christmas story and thinking about that night and all that Mary and Joseph went through, all that God went through to get to us, and then how he revealed himself to mankind. And as you've heard before, there are a ton of people who saw it and got it, but there are a lot more who missed it. And my fear is that it's not much different today, is that there's still a lot of people who miss it. Well, like I said, I love movies, and as a traditionalist, I know that supposedly tells, they're telling us that the last Star Wars movie is out, right? Who believes that? They're going to keep milking this thing for all it's worth, right? So there's going to be sides. But one of the things that I love about how Star Wars starts, it's traditional, right? What happens? You hear the music, boom, but about, you know, and we all know the music, you know, and, and, and then what the words start coming on your screen, right? And you start reading the words. And what it does is it kind of gives you a backstory. And then it tells you what's happening and it sets you up for what is about to take place. <laughs> I love that. And I get excited and kind of cheesy and geek out when the Star Wars starts that way. And it's so cheesy too. I mean, I look at it and I'm like, that's not really great technology for the 21st century. <laughs> but I love the traditional part of it. And you know, we can come time and time again to God's story and, and, and we go, well, uh, you know, I, I've heard it or I've seen it. I know what to expect. But you know what I've learned? I don't know what to expect. I think I do. And there are some pieces that I am familiar with, but each and every time I hear God's story, his word, his truth, he reveals something new to me. So I was thinking about this. I was thinking about movies, and I was thinking about God's word as a movie. And you know what? There is a definite storyline. You see, there's a setup, 
in Genesis that it says that God created us. He created everything. And he created us. And he didn't just create us, but he created us in what? In his image. And the verbiage there in Genesis is plural. It's a we created them. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all there at creation. So that's where the story starts. We're like, oh, that's a great story. What could go wrong? Well, of course, we know the story, right? It goes wrong pretty quickly from what it seems like. And from that point on, the storyline starts. You see a crisis breaks out. And that crisis is that through Adam and Eve, we collectively broke God's heart. And we are pretty good about breaking everything else too. <laughs> One of the things that um, would happen, not it wasn't rare, but on Christmas Day, you know, you open up all the presents and inevitably, one thing would get broken in our house. One of the new gifts. Ever have that happen? And like, oh, my name is, well. you know, we're all crying. I mean, it happened. So, I mean, Christmas morning can be a reminder of how we're really good at breaking things. But I'm so thankful that God is really good at fixing things. He's not just good at creating things, but he's good at fixing things. And in his perfect plan, he's like, oh, you broke it. Yes, Chuck, you're the reason we can't have nice things. <laughs> but it's okay. I've got a plan to fix this. I am so thankful for his plan because his plan, then after we broke God's heart, sends us on this journey. And this journey was this continual trying to get back to life and love. But every path we took was a dead end. And God knew this. He saw this. And he saw his people trying to get back to them. And yet, when you read the book of Judges, one of the great books, it just says that they do well with Jesus, they do well with God, and then they fall off. They do well with God, and they fall off. Boy, <laughs> who can relate to that? God had a plan. And he knew that every path back to life and love was a dead end. And so he had a solution for us. And the solution started with Jesus being born. God came in the form of Jesus to restore what we had broken. He came in the form of flesh so that we might relate and connect with him. He is the solution. The climax, of course, is not the birth of Jesus, but the death of Jesus. Wait a second. You're going to send your only son to die for me, for my sins? Yeah. And just like every movie or every story, that's the climax, right? Like, oh my goodness, what's going to happen now? And in that climax moment, God provides yet another solution of salvation. Jesus goes from life to death to life again. Why? So that we could be a part of that. You see, he gave us life, but we chose death. When we chose sin, we chose death over the life he gave. And because of that, he says, all right, we're going to try this again, but in a different way. And I'm going to offer you the invitation of life again for here and for eternity. The conclusion of this story, of course, is that we can all receive Jesus ourselves and live in peace with God and each other. But the truth is we have to receive it. I can't remember ever not taking a gift my parents gave me, <laughs> right? It seems like, I, I'm sure there were a few that I wasn't excited about, like maybe socks and underwear, you know? <laughs> but I knew I needed them. And I received them anyway. I'm like, oh yeah, mom, thanks for the socks and underwear. Where's the good stuff, right? <laughs> and just like I have never turned away a gift from my parents, why would I turn away a gift from God himself? 
And he desires for us to receive his perfect gift in his son Jesus. And not just at his birth, but at his death and resurrection too. Amen? Christmas points us to the resurrection. Life to death to life again. God did his part. Will we do ours? I started thinking of this a little more and I was reminded of a story in the Gospels of a man named Nicodemus. And it says this about Nicodemus. It says that he was a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. And after, uh, uh, it was after dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. He said, Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Now what you're gonna hear in this is both the Christmas and the resurrection story. If you listen He says, your miraculous signs are evident that God is with you. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man like me go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you that no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. Humans can produce only human life, but the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Nicodemus asked, how are these things possible? And Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. But I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about the earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about the heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man, he has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on the pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Are you hearing both stories in there? The Son of Man came down from heaven. Now, this is the part that we are most familiar with. Jesus goes on to say to this to Nicodemus. He says, for this is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for their sins will be exposed. But those, those who do what is right, come to the light so that others can see that they are doing what God wants. To have life, we must be born. That's a no-brainer. To have spiritual life and eternal life, we must be born again. You see, God gave life. But through Jesus, he was offering a new life. Why? Because we were dead in our sin. And he was like, but this life is gonna be different than what the law tries to give you. This life will lead you to God the Father himself. This life is the only one found in and through Jesus. Jesus is the light that leads us through the darkness of life. Do you believe life can be dark at times? I know I've experienced that. His life and the Christmas marks this light, the light that's coming into the world to illuminate the way 
of God for every single purpose. And not just the way of God, but the way to God. And Jesus is this light. I listen to a lot of music, except for country, sorry. (laughs) Sorry, not sorry, there we go. Kind of like that Reese's commercial. One of my favorite bands, and maybe this will date me, but it's a band that I started listening to in high school. It was a little teeny band out of Ireland called U2. (laughs) They've had a hit or two. They've done all right. And uh, on their last album, though, they, they wrote this song called There Is a Light. And every time I hear this song, I, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly drawn in to the fact and reality of Jesus being the light of the world and being this new life that's offered to all. But I thought that there, there's a line in this song, there's a lyric in this song that just, wow, I, I, I constantly think about. And I was thinking about it again this Christmas season. And here, here's what it says, and it's from u two song, There Is a Light. It says this, it says, And know that darkness always gathers around the light. If there is a light, we can't always see. If there is a world, we can't always be. If there is a dark, now we shouldn't doubt. And there is a light. Don't let it go out. But the line that captures my attention every time is that first one. And know that darkness always gathers around the light. Even with Jesus in me and me in him, the light of the world, darkness is continually trying to squeeze him out. I don't know how dark the night was that Jesus was born, but I know that there was a star to light the way. And that star led them directly to the light himself, Jesus. And it's no different. The darkness, its desire is to extinguish God and his light. But Jesus will not be extinguished. And he desires for us, well, as the young people say, to get lit. (laughs) (laughs) But in a scriptural way, right? And Jesus is who lights us. Maybe that was a stretch. I don't know. Forgive me. Uh, for I know not what I say. No, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna, I want to invite the worship team to come back up. And as we do, I have one more portion of Scripture to read to you. It's probably one of my favorite Christmas portions. And yet, oftentimes, we don't think of it as, but it is. In the Gospel of John, he writes this in the first chapter. In the beginning, in the very beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things, all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, And the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light. So that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light. The light that gives to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. 
and the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And from His abundance, from His abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing, gift after another. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus the Christ. And no one has ever seen God. But the unique one, Jesus, who is himself God, is near to the Father's heart. And he has revealed God to us. And this is God to us. It is God with us, and he is God who is for us. And it is why we gather again tonight to be reminded of his great story of our rescue, of our redemption, of our relationship, not just for the short time we're here on earth, but according to his word, for eternity. Eternity was lying in a manger. Eternity had to have his diapers changed. Eternity was real and in the flesh for us to receive. Would you stand with me? In a moment, we're going to sing a song, his song, that tells his story. And you're probably going to recognize the melody and the chorus But the words that you're going to see on the screen are a little different. And I encourage you to sing along, to think along, to receive along. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your story. We thank you, God, for your perfect gift wrapped in flesh for us. Something that can be touched and held and something that could touch us back and hold us back. I can't imagine what it would be like to to see Jesus as a newborn, as an infant, a child, an adolescent, a young adult, an adult. But you chose this crazy plan so that we could be drawn, our attention drawn to you so that we could receive what you have for us. And I thank you that this gift points us to something bigger and greater and what Jesus had yet to do. So again, reveal yourself to us as we continue to sing of your great story, your great love, your great invitation and gift that is Jesus.